Hi, welcome to my session on Working Smarter in Lightroom Classic. To me, working smarter means taking advantage of the built-in efficiencies that Lightroom Classic has to offer. Its original purpose when it was released was to be a more efficient alternative to Photoshop Bridge and Camera Raw. In this session, I am focusing on importing, library module, develop module, and exporting because I feel like those are the places where we spend the most time and can gain back the most time if we're a little bit more efficient in some of the things that we do. Lightroom Classic has a lot of ways for creating reusable templates, presets, for taking advantage of shortcuts, modifying the interface, and things like that. So in this session, we're gonna kind of jump through those uh, and try to do it kind of quickly because I only have a certain amount of time. But I prepared a session workbook that goes much deeper and in more detail than I'm able to show in this uh, amount of time I have here. So that session workbook is basically like a chapter in a book on, on this. It's over uh, 30 pages in, in length. It's, it's huge. So uh, if you're interested in the VIP pass, you're going to get a whole lot more information uh, that you can work through step by step. But I'm going to show you the highlights and uh, everything that I, can sh that I can fit in in this time. All right, so let's get started looking at just the interface itself. That is a place where uh, low-hanging fruit, yes, but you can really make your, your life a lot simpler if you take advantage of these things. One of them is I'm in what's considered normal screen mode. If I go up to the window menu, come down to screen modes, and I see this is set to normal. And there's nothing wrong with it except that it's not utilizing as much of my screen real estate as it could be. It's also uh, not helping me to block out distractions from the purpose of why I'm here. So even if I just do this and fill the screen with normal screen mode, that's better. To take it to the next level though, if you go up to the screen mode menu, you'll see that there's other screen modes. My favorite is full screen. And you can cycle through the screen modes by pressing Shift and F. And so I'm gonna share some keyboard shortcuts, but not. I'm gonna try not to do too many because it's a little overwhelming. But I will point out that many of the, sh the keyboard shortcuts are right in the menu system as you go. So if I wanted to switch between my screen modes, I'm gonna press Shift F, and now I'm in full screen with menu bar. Shift F again, and now I'm in full screen, and now Lightroom Classic is my primary focus which is why I am here. If I need to access the menu bar, just put your cursor near the top, the menu bar will come back out. If you wanna learn a bunch of keyboard shortcuts for each module, come to the help menu, go to library module shortcuts, and you'll see a whole bunch of shortcuts that are just waiting for you to learn and practice. In each module, you'll find the similar list of shortcuts uh, designed around the shortcuts that pertain to that module. So you can go to that help menu in whatever module you're in and you'll find more shortcuts. We've maximized screen real estate, great. Let's reduce some of the other clutter that maybe we don't need right at this time. One of those things is the module picker. Lightroom Classic has been around for a while and technology has evolved and I don't really use the web module anymore. So I can actually remove it from the module picker and have one less distraction. I don't do a lot of slideshows, I can hide that as well. So you can tailor what modules show just by right-clicking the module picker and choosing. And you can always bring them back, all right? And I find that just further streamlines your workflow. Another way to streamline your workflow is to take advantage of the individual panels and only having open the panel that you wanna work on at that particular time. Now notice over here, uh, we have a solid disclosure triangle, whereas on this side, I have a dotted disclosure triangle. This panel is set to solo mode. So that means if I open one panel and then go to open an additional panel, the first panel will collapse. And that saves on a whole lot of scrolling. To engage solo mode, you can alt or option click any of the panels in the panel group that you're working in, and that will enable it. You can also right click on one of the panel headers and just choose it from the contextual menu. While we're in the contextual menu, I'll point out that you can also hide individual panels if there's a panel that you just don't use and you just wanna remove it as a distraction. So I don't use published services much. 
I can turn that off and I can just focus on the panels that I do use. One other useful panel tip that I want to share is oftentimes you're working in either the left panel group or the right and you really want to maximize the screen real estate for your photographs. Whether you're in loop view as I am here or grid view here and you just want to have less scrolling here by just hiding one of the panels that you're not using. So if I click on this arrow right here or really anywhere on this edge of the, of the panel, it will collapse that panel and move it out of the way. If I move my cursor back over, it automatically reappears. And it may do that when I'm really just trying to maybe reach the scroll bar or some other purpose of being over here, like just to select the photo. So if you right click on this edge, instead of using auto hide and show, set it to auto hide. The way auto hide works is it won't automatically appear when you put your cursor over the edge, but you can click on it to bring it up. You could go into a panel if you need to finish your work in that panel. And as you move your cursor off the screen, it automatically hides again. And you can set that for either of the panels, depending on which side you're working on. Okay. Let's talk about the film strip before we move on. The film strip is an interface component that is accessible in all of the modules. It's often one that we have visible and if it is hidden, it's only a click away. So a couple of things that you might want to think about with your film strip. One is its height. So if you put your cursor right on this line between the toolbar and the top of the film strip, you can click and drag and make it smaller or taller. Once you make it tall enough, that the thumbnail badges and even star ratings or flags are visible, that can be helpful to you in your workflow. Now it's important to realize that these are actually functioning buttons by default. If I press the J key up here, we see those thumbnail badges appear here as well. And if I click, I can jump to other collections. I can jump to the crop tool, develop module, keywording, and those are active buttons. By default, they're active buttons down here. I've turned that off and you do that by right clicking here, go to view options and check ignore clicks on badges. If that's unchecked, then you could accidentally when trying to just select a photo, you could click one of the buttons and it maybe takes you to a place you don't want to go at that moment in time. So that's just view options and ignore clicks on badges. If you don't want to see the badges at all, because you're not using them, you can turn them off as well. And that's also controlled by just the height of the film strip. I personally like to have the film strip small enough that I can access the thumbnails, but without having to see a lot of the other stuff on it. And it's just an easier way to click and select a different photo. All right, let's move on to importing. So I have a memory card already mounted on my hard drive here. And when I click the import button, the import dialog opens and that memory card is already selected. Our primary way of importing is to ingest new photos into our library. Now it's possible you're importing photos that are already in a primary location. And in that case, you're going to use the add option, but the most repetitive type of import would be copying photos from a memory card to your primary storage location. And what you want to just think about at a high level is the source, where you're importing from, what are you doing, and where is it going to? This where's it going to part, I think in order to really be the most efficient, is to standardize on a single location where all photos come in. Once they arrive, you can do your selects, your sorting, whatever you need to do. And if after that point, whatever photos remain, you can use Lightroom Classic to move them to other folders, move that folder to another drive, do whatever it is you want to do, but don't waste time here having to think about where are these going to go? Is, is it all in the same shoot? Is it multiple places or whatever those things are? Let's let Lightroom Classic do that heavy lifting and thinking for us. And we can just get through this window as quickly as possible. So source, what's happening? Where's it going? So for me, where's it going is all about the destination panel. I'm on a 2018 MacBook Pro here. It is my primary computer these days and I use the heck out of it. 
So while I have external drives connected to it at different times, I don't always have one connected. And so the internal drive, the pictures folder, and specifically this folder here, imported photos, that's my go-to destination for all new photos coming in, regardless of their source, why they were created, or even what device was used to, to capture them. It's my import default location. To simplify this view right here, if you double click on a folder, it will collapse everything else and make this nice and tidy. So what I like to do is have the imported photos folder selected, so it's highlighted. Then I have in the organized section here by date and I choose a date format that I like. Now, as you can see with the other folders that are already imported, I don't just use dates, but I add that additional information after import. It's super easy, super fast, and really helps me in the rest of my workflow. At this stage, all I want Lightroom Classic to do is to copy the photos to the location I've chosen. And this is always the parent folder I have selected for every single import from now until forever. And to put it in a folder based on the capture date of each photo. Simple, don't need to think about it any more than that. Now, beyond those two things, selecting the source, selecting the destination, there are additional efficiencies of tasks you can have the import window do to save you time down the road. One of those is in the file handling panel. I'm not gonna go into all the options here, just the ones that I think are most important. Using this embedded in sidecar has totally changed things for me. So I shoot with an Nikon D850. Those are all 45 megapixel raw files. They're quite large and would take a while to render out standard or one-to-one -one previews during a time when I wanna go through and choose which ones I wanna keep or delete. I can see right away, there's some not keepers in this, in this batch. So by choosing embedded in sidecar, it uses the camera generated JPEG that gets embedded as a thumbnail inside the raw file. And if your camera doesn't uh, embed a full size raw file, you can shoot raw plus JPEG and it will treat that JPEG as the sidecar and display that for you. It makes this process so much faster, the ingestion process so much less painful, and you can get right to evaluating your photos without having to wait uh, for a whole bunch of previews to render. So that's number one. I leave that on all the time. I don't typically rename during import just because I end up deleting some photos and I rename after to close the gaps in the file name numbering. So I'll do that after. Apply during import, the only thing I care about here is my metadata template. I go into that in more detail in the session notebook on how to really you know, create one and update one. But basically, it's just my copyright and contact information that I attach to every photo's metadata as part of the import process. I don't typically apply a develop preset during import, but it's possible. We'll talk about that when we look into the develop module. But what I do recommend is setting your custom raw default to do some of that work for you right out of the gate. I haven't set a custom default yet. It's still on the Adobe default, but we'll look at modifying that as we move into the develop module. That's really it. That's my standard baseline import for every time I am bringing in photos. The key to making this process smooth and efficient is this really hard to spot import preset dropdown menu down here. It's probably set to none if you've never set one. If I click on this dropdown menu, we could see I have a bunch of import presets. All you do is configure these panels the way that you want them, then choose save current settings as a new preset, and give it a meaningful name and click create. Now I already have one that I'm gonna use and it's the same settings as I just showed you. I call it speedy because that's what it does. It just speedily gets the job done. And it includes this destination. So all I need to do on future imports, and let me just show you. So I'm gonna click uncheck all and I'm just gonna import a few of these just to show you the benefit of creating an import preset. So I've got that speedy lined up, I, that means that all my settings are the way I want them. I click import and they start to come in. The photos are being copied to my internal hard drive and this thumbnail icon right here is telling me the embedded previews are being used. And so if I want to start viewing this at uh, 100% one to one, I can press and hold the Z key and I am zoomed right into 100% using the embedded preview. I let go of the Z key and I'm right back out. 
And those are 45 megapixel images. I can just zoom through this whole process really fast. Now, let me show you what happens. Once you've got your settings dialed in and have had a successful import, when I click the import button, it successfully ejected as it said it would. So I put my memory card back in. And then once that memory card's mounted, I'll select it. It recognized which were already imported. And now everything's ready to go. It's all checked. All I need to look and see, yeah, there's my preset. It's already loaded. I don't have to think about or do anything else other than click the import button. And the rest of those photos come on in. It's a real huge time saver. So much so that when you're importing, you could click this secret button down here and it just condenses that import window right on down to the bare minimum. And all you need to do is make sure your preset is selected and bring on in your photos. You don't have to mess around with it any more than that whatsoever. All right. So I want to go look at this entire shoot together. So I'm going to go to the folder in library. And so there's that folder. Lightroom Classic created it based on the capture date time. And that's perfect for my needs right now. So what I want to do next is just go through a simple process that I find is super efficient for reviewing your photos in a binary way. Is it a keeper? It's a pick. Is it a reject X uh, for a shortcut? And am I unsure at this moment in time I need to skip to make things move faster? Uh, that is where I use the unflag shortcut, which is the letter U. So P for pick, X for reject, and U for skip, <laughs> for unflag. By default, a photo comes in in an unflag state. Now, if I go to the photo menu, auto advance is, should be checked by default. If it's not, put a check there. And so when I'm evaluating photos, I'm really just having my hands on the keyboard. I'm pressing the Z key if I want to zoom in for 100%. I let go of the Z key, I'm back here. I press P if it's a pick. If I need to check multiple times, I press and hold Z. If I'm not sure, because I have a bunch of similars here and I want to just move through to the next uh, location, I'll press U. U triggers auto advance without changing the state. So I've got one pick flag here and then these are unchanged, but that's okay because I just want to keep moving through the process. I'll come back to those, press and hold. Okay, that's fine. Pick. That's a little soft reject and you get the idea. So I won't bore you with going through each one of these, but I'll reject a bunch and uh, pick flag some and reject some. And that's as quick as it, the process usually goes at this stage in the game. Now I can take advantage of the attribute function of the library filter. Whenever you're in grid view, this library filter appears at the top. If it's not visible, Make sure you're in grid view, but if you're in grid view and it's still not visible, press the backslash key because it could be accidentally hidden. So on the attribute section here, we have flags, edit state, ratings, color labels, virtual copy and uh, video file, that kind of thing. All I'm really concerned about here is flag state. And so I just went through this whole shoot and I want to go back and see if I skipped any. So I'm going to right click on this and choose unflagged only. Now it pulls up all those photos that I skipped using the U key. Now I need to make a decision. Is it a pick or is it a reject? And as soon as I assign either a pick flag or a reject flag, it will remove it from view because it won't match this filter any longer. So I'll press and hold. Okay, that's not bad. I press P, that photo is gone. And I'm checking. And maybe I'm looking like, you know, the expression on this, those aren't that great. Let me just reject those, but that one's better. And I can just kind of quickly go through these. Let's check that one. Oh, that's fine. And good. So I just went through and now all the photos in that shoot are either a pick or a reject. Now I can change this filter or I can just disable it. So if I press command or control L, that will turn off the filter. And now I can come back and view the rest of the photos. If I want to make sure I didn't accidentally reject one that I'm maybe shouldn't have, I can filter on just rejects and I can do a quick double check really easily. If I want to just see all of the picks without seeing the rejects, 
then I can see, yeah, here's the my selects and these are the ones I'm going to run on uh, into the next stage in my workflow. So a few keyboard shortcuts saves you a huge amount of time and that embedded in sidecar makes that process go super simple. Once I go to the develop module, the embedded preview will be automatically replaced by a Lightroom generated one based on the default settings. We're going to modify those so we can use a better starting point. The next stage that I think about here is once I've got this folder and I've made these choices, I usually rename the folder and it just takes a few seconds. Just right click the folder you want to rename and choose rename from the contextual menu. Now I like to keep the date, it's already there, it's useful. And then I'll just name him after the Martian Manhunter, John Jones, and click save. So. That renamed the folder here in the folders panel. If I right click again and choose show in finder or show in explorer on windows, it renames the folder on the drive as well. So now I have information in the folders panel, both on the capture date, as well as some relevant information for me. And that information is super helpful in other parts of your workflow. So over time, as long as you're consistent in your naming, if I come up to the folders panel here and just type in John, this filter at the top of the panel will filter the contents across all drives to match only other folders that contain the whatever you typed in there. So if I want to say, think about place I'd like to go, and I type in Glacier or Glacier National Park, it pulls up all of the folders that contained those four letters. And that is super helpful. So I showed you the library filter before. I want to show you how this simple technique can be really handy when searching your entire catalog. So we go to the text function here instead of attribute, and it's a text search. It could be based on any number of things, but if I want to pull up photos that haven't been keyworded in this way, and I'll just type in Yosemite for Yosemite National Park, and we can see that these thumbnails, there's no keyword badge. There is on these, but not on all of these. And the reason that these showed up is because if I right click on this and choose go to folder and library, the folder name is what it's pulling it up on. So as long as I continue to rename my folders based on consistent, relevant information, it really saves me a huge amount of time in my workflow. Here's a little bonus tip. When you've got lots of folders and subfolders expanded and you want to just collapse all of them uh, nice and quick and tidy, this is why one of the reasons why I have a parent folder at the top of each one of my drives. But if you alt or option click, so hold down the alt or option key and click on the disclosure triangle for the parent folder, it will collapse everyone, that's nice. But if I reopen it, all of the subfolders have now been closed. So just here again, alter option click, and all of the subfolders get closed as well. So as you think about your workflow, think about ways you can be consistent and standard in your naming, in your workflow, and it will make the whole process that much more efficient over time. All right, so there's the folders panel. Uh, since we're talking about the filter here, I'll just point out a couple other features on the folder panel filter. And so, for example, in my demo folder here, we see it has a color label. You can right click on folders and apply a color label. This is a place where you would want to come up with some standard uh, meaning for each of these color labels if you're going to apply them. So for me, yellow just means there's a photo in that folder that is an HDR, either a merged uh, bunch or maybe it was an in-camera HDR. And so I try to remember to color label the photos and then I color label the folder. Then I can come up to this and choose filter on color label and I can get to all of those folders uh, in a hurry. So how you come up with these meanings is entirely subjective, entirely up to you and totally optional but I find it to be very helpful once you start to think about groupings that are pretty common in your particular style of photography. Now, this other option here is also really handy, favorite folders. Now, to make a folder a favorite, 
you would right click on it and choose Mark Favorite. And so now it gets a little star, that little star there, and I can choose to filter on just my favorites. This could be really handy if maybe you have just a section of folders, you're going to sit down with a client, you don't want them to see all of the folders that are totally not relevant to their particular job. Just favorite theirs and filter on favorites. And that look like your catalog only contains photos about uh, their project. Beyond the folders panel, we have to talk about the collections panel because that's really handy too. I'm going to turn off this filter. It's really important to remember to do that. Go back to all. And so let's say I want to add a new collection based on this shoot. I can right click on this and choose create collection. That will open up the create collection dialog box. It will make a collection with this entire folder. I can choose to put it in an existing collection set, which I think is always a good idea. And so if I come down, uh, down here, my sessions, I'll add it to my sessions uh, collection set and click create. Now we see this thumbnail badge appeared for collections and there's now a collection in the collections panel based on that name, right? Now it brought over all of the photos. So if this is going to be my selects that I move forward with, this is where I can take advantage of the attributes I applied. Just show me all my rejects. I'm going to select them all because I'm in a collection now. When I press delete, it just removes them from the collection. I press command or control L, turn off the filter, and now I just have my picks ready to go and move on in the workflow. Within the collections panel, just to point out, there is also a filter. You can apply color labels to, to collections as well. And if you sync to the Lightroom Cloud, this collection, this catalog is not synced, so it won't work here, but you can also filter just to show collections that are synced. And how you would apply these, you would need to come up with a consistent way to do it, but I highly recommend that you give that some thought. There's not a way in here in the collections panel to mark a collection as a favorite, but it is possible to do. So I have this collection selected right now. That's right, active selection. If I come back to our good friend, the film strip and click on this little breadcrumbs, we see it shows the name of what my source is, how many photos are in it, which one's selected. Great. If I click on this, it actually pops up a whole bunch of options. I can see my recent sources so I can jump back and forth that way. I can see sources that I have set as a favorite. So there's that folder I marked as a favorite. I also have a collection set that I've marked as a favorite. Now, if you right click on a collection, there isn't a mark as favorite option here. But within this menu, down at the bottom, you can click on add to favorites. And now I've added that collection uh, to my favorites, All right? This little plus sign, that means this is set as the target collection. So if I right click on this, this checkbox here means set as target collection. That is a collection where you can just quickly have photos added to it by pressing a single key. And so within the target collection, this little gray button here, that button is the same thing as adding a photo to this target collection. When you see the button, it means these photos are part of the target collection. And if I click on this button, it will remove it from the target collection. If I press Command and Control Z, it will bring it back. If I wanted to add a photo from a favorite location to my target collection, I just press the B key, B for boy, coincidentally, and it will add that photo to my target collection just like that. And pressing the B key will remove it from the target collection. The target collection can only be one of these regular type of collection, meaning it's just a manually created collection as opposed to a smart collection. I have what I call my catalog dashboard, and I've written a whole lot about this in the session handout. But basically what I call my catalog dashboard is a series of collection sets that contain smart collections. A smart collection has a special icon with a little gear on it, and they can be configured to automatically gather up files based on whatever criteria you can think of 
that is supported <laughs> by the smart collection. So in this case, all 8-bit files in, in this particular catalog. If I double click on this, it will bring up the rules, the edit smart collection dialog box. And so for 8-bit files, bits per channel is eight. And that's just a quick way for me to keep tabs on different bit depth for files. Why might you do that? Well, 32-bit files, are big. <laughs> they really take up a lot of space. These were kind of all the rage before we had the photo merge uh, to HDR within uh, Lightroom Classic to save out a DNG file. One of these days I'm going to come through and redo these and possibly delete the very large TIFF file. There's a lot more I could say about smart collections. They're super powerful and I highly recommend uh, you play around with these and make them work for you. I go into them much more in depth in the workbook but I really wanna move on to discuss another type of customizable saved search that you can use in all over, the, all over Lightroom Classic to help you find and filter your photos. And that is back to our friend, Library Filter Bar. So I showed you a couple ways that you can use this, but as you start to get familiar with it, you can actually save combinations of settings of these different filters as a custom library filter. For example, right now there's a preset here that has the filters off, but based on the source that I'm in, which is collection set, all collections, all right, so that's a very wide source, a range of photos. If I want to find all of the photos that have a blue color label, I can click on this. And this is just a saved library filter preset based on the blue color label. So once you dial in whatever combination of settings you want in the library filter, just come down to save current settings as a new preset, give it a meaningful name and click create. It'll get added in there, but guess what? It's also accessible down here in the film strip. So I could also try to pull up all my HDR panos. That's accessible wherever the film strip is accessible. So remember the library filter filters the current selected source. Use that based on the source that you have selected if you want to say find information out like maybe what file type and camera was used on this particular source. That's just a library filter preset that I created and I can access that. All right, so there's way more in both of those things in the workbook. I want to move on to the develop module. So let's select a photo that actually needs to be developed. Press D and jump to develop. One of the areas that I feel like uh, you can work a whole lot smarter is if you get your preset panel under control. Now, I don't think of presets as necessarily things that you buy and they're amazing and wonderful, although that could be true. I think of presets as working smarter as custom presets that you create based on your own workflow needs, taste, and so on. And it they evolve over time, just like your taste does. So Lightroom Classic comes preloaded with these preset groups that contain some presets for you to play around with. And some are okay and some are not. But what I find is I don't ever go in these anymore. So let's hide them from view and simplify this preset panel. So when you come over to manage presets, you can just hide any preset group you no longer want to see. And what I want to see are all my custom preset groups down here at the bottom. So already the preset panel is much simpler. Now, if you have a whole lot of preset groups that maybe you've purchased and downloaded over the years, maybe you've made them yourself, this sorts alphanumerically. We have muscle memory. Your, your hand will go to where things are if they're in a consistent place. If you can reduce the amount of scrolling up and down and searching you're doing, you're gonna work a whole lot smarter. So if you name these numerically in an order that makes sense to you in your workflow, then they'll always be right where you want them to be. You can right click on a preset group and choose rename and give it a different name. Within a preset group, you can name presets so that they have a, a, an order that makes sense to you as well. Now this order kind of follows the order that the right panel group is in because that makes sense to me. I will point out that you can customize this. This is the only panel in Lightroom Classic. You could change the order of the panels if you want to. I have it on the default order just because I'm used to it. But if you find there's an order that works better for you in your workflow, by all means, customize that to make it work for you. So I'm going to reset this photo. And this is the Adobe default, raw default. So it just basically zeroes out everything. 
And so as, a, as you're learning, you can create presets to help you work faster. So instead of having to scroll up and down this whole panel, if you're basically applying the same types of settings or evaluating those same types of settings, you can have a preset. Presets now by default will give a live preview just by putting your cursor over the preset. So this preset is just like clicking the auto button here. And when I preview it, it's not applying the settings, it's showing me what it would look like. And hey, that's a much better starting place. I'll click it to apply it. Now, auto also includes vibrance and saturation. And sometimes to my taste, it goes too far. So I have a preset just to zero those out. I can continue to work down the panel and what I pretty much always apply is a profile correction. So there's a little bit of lens distortion in vignetting. That's what it looks like with the profile correction. Yeah, I wanna apply that. That's the same as coming into this panel and checking those two boxes. So by just moving my cursor a few millimeters down here, I've already applied baseline stuff that I wanna consider. Now, the rest of these presets are maybe more uh, subject matter specific, whether it's a portrait or a landscape, but that's just how I think. And what I want you to do is to set your presets up the way that you think. If you find that you're always applying the same bunch of presets, you might be thinking about, hey, can I just customize my default settings so that they always do this right out of the gate? Yes, yes, you can. So I'm going to reset this. Now, important point, resetting is resetting to the default. By default, it zeroes everything out. If you change that custom default, when you click reset, it's employing your defaults that you've customized. So for example, I probably wouldn't include auto because if I hit reset, I probably want the basic panel to reset back to zero but I might want to include a profile correction, right? I might want to include my own custom sharpening settings based on my taste, right? If I'm primarily a landscape person, maybe those are the settings that I want to in include in my default. And maybe there's a different profile that I want to in employ. Maybe Adobe Color isn't my favorite. I think it's just fine for a starting place, but maybe if I'm mostly a landscape person, I would include the landscape profile or maybe Adobe Standard is my taste, or maybe there's one of the camera ones that matches my camera. We have some different choices there that we can consider to include in a custom default. Now, the reason I left this open is because Adobe actually included some default presets that you might try out. The way this works is you have to go up to the preset panel in the preferences. So under on a Mac, under Lightroom Classic, on Windows, under Edit, Go to the preset panel, and this is what you'll find by default, Adobe default. You could set it to camera settings. It's basically Adobe default with everything zeroed out, except it will try to respect the camera profile that was included in your camera and try to match the profile based on that. So if I hit reset now, I'm on the camera settings, and we see it went to camera standard V2, which matched the profile for this particular camera when this picture was taken. That may or may not be helpful if you did not shoot with a profile intentionally, as I, in this case, as I did. So moving forward, you might say, oh, well, if Lightroom Classic is going to respect my camera profile, maybe that's a better default setting for me. So if I come back over to this panel, the other option is to actually choose a specific preset. And so these are the ones that Adobe included, these, these presets here, and you're welcome to try those out. But if you create your own custom one, so for example, I have some custom default presets down here that maybe I do want to try using auto, or maybe I do want to have a camera profile with a lens correction. Why not that? So if I employ that preset, which is in my raw default preset group here, it's just this one right here. So when I click reset, right, it's using the in-camera respecting the, the profile and applying my lens correction, and my detail, right? What makes sense for me may not make sense for you, but the point I'm trying to make is if there's baseline settings you're always applying, put them in a preset and apply that as your default. So how do you make that preset? Well, you got to figure out what your baseline is. And then you're going to have to create a preset. And creating a preset is as simple as clicking the Create Preset button, 
and then checking the boxes that match what you want to include. Putting it in a group, and so I'll call this new default. I think it's helpful to say something about the settings like maybe lens, detail, and camera settings for my profile. So if I want those things to be included, what boxes do I check? Well, I, I know I enabled lens profile correction, so I wanna go there and turn on lens profile correction, chromatic aberration. I included, or I wanna include camera settings, so I don't wanna choose a specific profile here. If I leave that unchecked, it should try to respect my camera settings uh, profile. Then the other thing I included was the detail panel, the sharpening settings. And so there's my lens correction, there's my sharpening, my detail panel, and by not including a profile, when you create a preset, it should respect the in-camera picture style. So I'll choose Create, and now that was added to my preset group. I go back to my preferences here, go back to that preset group, and I choose my new default, close out of there, hit Reset, and that applies to the, the, the defaults. It's the same as the other one, but you get the idea. So you can change that as often as you want, but just remember it's tied to the reset button here. When you have some all-in-one presets that maybe go further than that, so maybe I like the landscape profile and an auto adjustment and a profile correction and specific detail uh, sharpening settings for landscape photos. I can put that all in a single preset and have it be in a single click. So my defaults still exist, but now I can change them with a single preset and really move myself along my workflow a whole lot faster. So what you would include in your all-in-one is really up to you, all right? This isn't that much further off my default, except it includes the auto. Now I could decide to include that right out of the import process. So if you wanna set a, a preset for import, so say I was shooting a, this sunflower field, all the images were of the same thing, I wanted to apply that right from import, I can right click on that and choose apply on import. That preset is now already preloaded in my import dialog and ready for every photo to get the same treatment. If I don't include a preset on import, then that's where my defaults come into play. So get a hold of your preset panel, manage it, customize it, organize it. I go into this much more in depth in the workbook and then consider how you can use this to your advantage to make your workflow go so much faster and be so much more in control. Now, one last tip here is if your preset panel is just such a big giant mess <laughs> that you can't even begin here, here's a really quick tip. If you've got presets across different preset groups that you know you like, they're actually your favorites, you can right click on a preset and add it to your favorites. That will put it in the special group that always will appear at the very tip top. And you can include as many of those presets that you wanna favorite across every different group if that's what you wanna do. And I'm just kinda of randomly clicking on different ones across different groups here so we can see that it doesn't matter what group it's in. They all appear up here in the top. And even if you decide to hide a particular group using this manage preset option here, the presets that you favorited will still appear here. So you could really quickly condense this down to just your favorites. And when you have time to go back in there and organize them, uh, that can help you speed things up in your workflow. That's a quick look at some tips in there. And I wanna wrap up here with a quick look at export and how you can take advantage of some things there. So I'm gonna press the G key to go back to grid view. And let's say I want to export some photos. Now, these here are similar landscape photos. And if I come over to my um, panel here, that's conveniently hidden, come up here to quick develop, this section right here contains my presets. So I can come right down to my all-in-one landscape and apply that landscape all-in-one preset to the rest of these photos. And they're so much better that maybe they're not done, but maybe they're good enough. Now I can select all four of these quickly edited photos, and I wanna export them out for some purpose to share them in some way. So when the export dialog opens, you could tell how many files are selected, 
And this is your place to dial in all of the settings for the specific output reason you're exporting these copies. The key here that I want to make clear is that if you're exporting in files in a similar way, more than three times, it's a great candidate for creating a preset. I have a whole bunch of presets for things that I do on a pretty regular basis. All a preset does here is save some configuration of panels, right? So if I'm delivering some JPEGs, they're going to be automatically saved to the same folder as the photo, put in a subfolder with the name delivered, and even added back into the catalog, along with all of the other settings that I want to include, including opening up Photoshop and having those photos appear in Photoshop so I can give them one last once over before they get delivered. I find that to be helpful in my workflow. How you would configure this is entirely up to your specific needs. So here's a really simple one, just saving out JPEGs at resize to 1200 pixels on the long edge and RGB color, sRGB color space. So you can see without even opening the panels what the settings are. This option right here is a real time saver. So when you're choosing your location, if you have a specific location, obviously that's what you would choose. If it's the same place as the original, that's fine too. If you wanna to choose a folder later, which is useful for presets. So that way you can just leave that dialed in and sometimes you might want it to go to your desktop, sometimes you might wanna to go to your pictures folder and so on and so on. So you can choose that later uh, based on your needs. Everything else though is gonna be consistent. And including what I like to do if I'm not opening in Photoshop is just show that right in Finder so I can see the, the copies and maybe then attach them to an email or upload them or whatever I'm gonna do next. Once you've dialed in the settings that you want, click on Add, choose a group. Don't put in user presets. Either create a folder yourself or add it to one of your existing ones. All right, I'll put it in this one. Give it a meaningful name. Right? It's the same preset I already have, so I don't need to recreate it. And then click Create. Now that preset is there, all right? ready for you to act on at any time. Now I'm going to click on Done here, not Export, because I don't want to send them out. I want to show you a really valuable point for creating these presets. Once you've created those export presets, then you can just select the photos like this, come up to the File menu, go down to Presets, Export with preset. And here are all of my groups and all of the presets that I've created for those groups, including my meaningful name one that I just made. If I want to export those JPEGs at 1200 pixels in sRGB, I just click on that preset. Then I get prompted. Where do I want these to go? Well, how about on the desktop? And we'll call this 1200px. I click Create. And now a folder on my desktop with that name is going to be created. I click open. The preset applies all the settings in the export dialog, including open them up in Finder. And there they are ready for me to pass on to the next step in my workflow. Super, super handy to not have to configure and mess around with that export dialog every single time. Another cool feature. Now this is something that's outside of Lightroom Classic, but I want to make you aware of it because it's not an expensive thing and I have no association with it whatsoever. I just find it really useful. What I often do when I'm saving out copies like this is I want to zip them into a zip file and maybe put it in my Dropbox folder so that I can quickly hand it off via an email without attaching it, without attaching the actual file to the email, but just sending them a link to download that zip file. So under my export to option, I have a different option here called zip exporter. That's because I have a plugin with this name. How do we get to plugins? Well, here we have the plugin manager button right here. And the plugin manager is where you can install different plugins. Now, I'm not talking about external editors like the on one stuff here, or the perfectly clear. This is an export plugin. This is where I got it from. And there's a whole bunch of really cool, useful 
uh, plugins here. Now, I, like I said, I have no association with, association with this site, but what I know is all the people that create plugins here are just like us. They're just photographers. Maybe they're not like us in that they're super nerdy geeks who are smarter than me, <laughs> but they got to a point where they're like, well, geez, I really wish I could do this. And then they figured out how to do it. Then they make it available for the rest of us. And it's all like donation where it's not expensive whatsoever. So you go there, all the instructions for installing it are there. And I'm not saying this is the one you want. There's a, there's really a whole bunch. You should go check it out. But once you install this type of plugin, it's now available as an option on my export dialog box. So if I choose zip exporter, now I can choose where I want that to go. Well, I want it to go right into my Dropbox folder in the photos folder, and I'm going to give a file name demo for this particular zip file. That means that these photos will be exported per the rest of the settings here and then compressed into a zip file with this name in this location. That's a huge time saver for me because that would be two extra steps I would do after the export. I can name them. I can choose my file settings, resizing, sharpening, all that kind of stuff. Watermark, yes or no, whatever you want to do. Then when, you're, when you've got it all configured, you can make a preset for that. Zip to Dropbox, save in my hard drive uh, folder there. All right, and so now I've got my own preset ready to go. Now when I click Export, the same thing's going to happen. Those will get processed. At the end of the process, they get compressed into a zip file. And then if I go to that location, which is just in my Dropbox folder, inside of photos, right? There it is, right? That was just created. And because that's in Dropbox, I can right click on it and choose copy Dropbox link. And now I've got a, a link on my clipboard that I can paste into an email. I can send via a social, message, uh, social media. However, I wanna share that out. It's all ready to go. And all I had to do was uh, configure one thing on my export dialog box. So thank you so much uh, for spending this time with me. I hope you found this session helpful. And if you wanna learn more, definitely uh, get the VIP pass so that you can get that session workbook. It is jam packed with stuff in even more detail than I was able to cover here. You can always find me at robsylvan.com or on Lightroom Killer Tips. Uh, thank you so much, take good care.